So I'm really honored to have Brett Taylor here. He's uh, a co-founder of FriendFeed. He was CTO of Facebook for a while, and now he's starting a new uh, thing called Quip, which I've been using on my iPhone and iPad to work with other people and create documents. And uh, Well, we'll get into all that right now. Who are you? Uh, my name is Brett Taylor. I'm uh, the CEO of Quip, as you mentioned. Um, I was actually born and raised in the Bay Area. I uh, stayed here through Stanford, and uh, this is my second startup. And uh, um, I'm uh, really excited because it's the first time I've worked in business software, you know, software people use at work every day. And it's been a really interesting change of pace for me to go from the consumer world of things like Google Maps and Facebook into something that's a lot more productivity driven, actually something people pay for instead of being ad supported, which has been a big change. And uh, I'm really excited about having the, uh, at least the prospect of impacting people's work lives. Uh, so. I, I remember walking around Davos with Mark Zuckerberg and uh, before he bought FriendFeed and, and I was talking to him about FriendFeed and, and he was really intrigued with what you guys were doing with real time uh, interaction and and all sorts of stuff that now is commonplace yeah. in Facebook, right? They yeah. Like these live comments you see popping up on yeah. the screen. It seems like you, you built a whole career or a whole set of startups or things around this kind of real-timeness. Yeah, I think that's actually a, a really astute point. I mean, a, a big part of what we've tried to do with Quip is our design center is a whiteboard in an open office floor plan. And whenever we evaluate how good is our product, is how close has it come to that. You know, for those of us in engineering companies, the standard office layout is an open office floor plan like you have here at Rackspace. And usually if there's a product manager or a tech lead, they'll have a whiteboard in between all the desks with maybe the uh, punch list of things left to do or this many days till launch or whatever it is. And it's a really free form experience. Um, it's really passive. You can kind of look around to see who has their headphones on and you shouldn't bug, who's kind of looking to have a conversation, who's standing next to the coffee machine. And what's interesting about what we found with productivity software is it had just evolved so much less than social software. You know, not only was it not real time, it wasn't social at all. There was no sense of presence. If you wanted to communicate, you had to go back to email. No matter what tool you were using, it all went through email. And uh, we felt that a lot of the, I guess, advances, it maybe, maybe sounds pretentious, but you know, a lot of the user interface improvements we had done in social, which made it feel like you were actually having a conversation with people who are sitting next to you, none of that had made it into enterprise software at all. And a huge part of what we're doing is trying to take some of those concepts, whether it's having multiple people simultaneously work in real time, or just knowing what people are working on. Like one of my favorite features of Quip, I take BART into work every day, it shows people's profile pictures over what they're currently working on. So I can actually like open up Quip and see what everyone in the office is currently doing. Well, you have Quip running, so Rocky can actually share your screen. Oh yeah, so, and so um, the, uh, this is a demo account, so unfortunately no one's really online. I guess you, you could be online right now, but- yeah. uh, In the, fact, I am online. I oh, you are, okay, great. Um, Let's get it running, there we go. I got it running here. Um, you know, and so right now I can see you're online, I can see you're using your cell phone, and if I, I'll share a document with you here. Um, and and the, it popped up on my screen. Oh, great. And if you open that up, um, yep. all you actually see, your profile picture is right here um, over the document. I can see you're currently looking at that. And if you imagine that, you know, I'm on my BART train coming into work and someone's doing work uh, on the, you know, while they're already in the office, I can actually see what they're doing and I can respond to it. And, you know, I can, you know, open this document and have a chat thread as if I were sitting in the office next to them. And I just typed you great stuff. And I, on my screen it says read by Peter. I guess you're Peter today. Oh yeah, I'm Peter Asta. <laughs> so is my demo account, so I'm faking <laughs> it. Um, the, uh, so the, the neat thing about this is it really makes it feel like you're there, you know? And we feel like what really mobile means to work 
is technology conforms to your lifestyle rather than making your lifestyle conform to technology. And what's so cool about mobile devices, it means like if you're getting off the airplane, you can get your work done no matter what happened, you know. And similarly, if you're on that airplane, you can work offline because everything automatically syncs and you don't need to be connected to a web browser with a working internet connection. Um, and it means that, you know, if you happen to have a remote office, our first paying customer was actually an asbestos abatement company in Colorado, no joke. That's because half of those people are in the field working in buildings all day with iPads and half are in an office, you know, more white collar, traditional. And they just didn't have anything that worked in that environment. And I think it's, you know, technology shifts take a little longer than we all like to think in Silicon Valley, but I really believe in five or 10 years, we'll look back and every single piece of software we use will look different because we'll be using it on all these different devices, different screen sizes. You'll swap them in and out throughout the day. And I think that's really the new normal. And uh, I'm really excited to kind of change the way this software looks and feels. So it doesn't feel like, you know, a typesetting tool. Because honestly, when was the last time you printed a document, you know? Not, not very often. Yeah. <laughs> not lately, at yeah. least. <laughs> I, I'm reevaluating this space because, uh, well, Microsoft came into this space last week right, yeah. with, with Office, and uh, so they woke up to the uh, to the revolution of iPad. I, I mean, here at Rackspace, we have uh, Apple TVs in a lot of the conference yeah. rooms, and a lot of people have iPads that they'll come to a meeting with, and somebody will project using AirPlay onto the screen, right? And so iPad has really changed how we work. Um, Tell me what, what the space looks like to you. What, what's the competitive landscape now that Microsoft has jumped in? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think the what I would say is what's typical with these technology shifts, like whether it was the mainframe to the PC or the growth of the internet in the late 90s or now the growth of smartphones and tablets, most of the incumbents tend to view the new technology as an extension of the old technology, you know? And so the, in the case of the mainframe, IBM viewed it as a way of providing terminals into the, the, the mainframe, you know? In the case of the internet, it was internet enabling PC applications. But if you look like 10 years later, the companies that really changed the way we v worked with this new technology as a medium, they were typically born in that era. And when I look at Office for iPad, it's actually really well done. I was really impressed, mainly with the design. It really feels like an iPad application, but it's not really any different. It lets you typeset words on a page. It's still in virtual eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, which is sort of funny given, uh, I'd love to know what percentage of documents are read on a piece of paper now versus on a screen. It's yeah. gotta be shifting pretty rapidly. Um, you know, you can't collaboratively edit, you know, none of the features that make Quip what it is, like messaging and presence, you know, work in the product. And so for me, it really feels like there is essentially the product views the tablet as a computer with a touch screen. Um, and we view it as something really different. You know, if you look at what makes mobile devices great is they can buzz your pocket when something happens. They can reach out to you and push notifications are huge. They have a GPS in it, so location is really important. You know, they're social because they're always connected to the internet, so things can update in real time. And for me, I view most of the interesting stuff happening in the areas as startups, just because they were kind of born in this era and sort of out of necessity, we have to, you know, have a very strong point of view with our products. Otherwise, why would you consider us versus the much more uh, popular and widespread incumbents? And so in that regard, I really view, uh, I think there's a bunch of interesting startups working in, I guess what you could characterize as enterprise or productivity software. And then there's a lot of incumbents who are trying to leverage their market share to you know, move into this new market and use their existing customers as a way of gaining, gaining uh, prominence there. Um, but as history is going to show, like hopefully, Startups like ours will have a chance just because, uh, you know, there's not like a, any one company with huge market share and productivity on uh, tablets and smartphones yet. Yeah. So. What, what have you learned uh, uh, from doing friend feed and then being CTO of Facebook that you're applying here? Um, I think there's a couple of things. One is the importance of people and making social features really baked into the product experience. Um, one of the really small parts that's completely commonplace in consumer applications is profile pictures. You know, you really can't find a consumer product without profile pictures next to people's names. Yeah. And it comes from this very simple insight that I think probably Mark Zuckerberg at least talked about very f explicitly first, which was, you know, we really recognize people's faces. And, you know, and if you see their face in a product, it feels like they're there. It makes it go from a computer 
interaction to something that feels much more human. You know, our product is really bakes a lot of those social design best practices throughout the, the product, whether it's presence, uh, really uh, aggressive use of profile pictures. So you really feel like you're working with people. Yeah, even that little uh, you read. Like yeah, on read screen, receipts. It says yeah. read by Robert, right? Yeah. Just those little touches make you feel, oh, that guy's actually there, and therefore I'm going to interact even more with. Yeah, with down here in the bottom left, you'll see as the changes are made to the document, you can actually see you know who's read what and when. Um, it also happens to cut down a lot on email because you don't need to say, hey, Robert, did you see this? Because I can see it right here, which yeah. within an office setting is incredibly valuable. Um, the other thing that we took away from it that I think Google and Facebook together was really making the product experience simple, um, no instruction manual. Um, the world of enterprise software is really interesting because it's really sales driven. Um, if you read, you know, Boxes S1, I think they're a very traditional, uh, they're obviously a young, but a very traditional enterprise software company, primarily sales and marketing. And that means that, you know, the stereotypical steak dinner, you, know, you take the IT purchasing person out to a steak dinner, convince them that your payroll software is the best thing since sliced bread. And then somewhere a few months later, all the employees get an email saying, here's how you do expense reports now. Yep. And that's it. There's no, uh, there's no feedback loop. Nope. And I think the probably the product we're inspired by the most are products like the iPhone or like Gmail um, that sort of started off with a consumer product design philosophy and then made their way into the enterprise. You know, it took iPhone a while to overcome the IT departments who thought that Blackberries were more secure or you know a safer bet. But over time, I think consumer demands vastly sort of outweighs those concerns. Um, and now with the App Store, if you don't like the product you're using at work, you just download a new one. And I think that we're really trying to feel like a consumer product. It's not really even download, it's, it's sort of go-to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so we're really trying to like, even though our business model is 100% enterprise, we make our money by selling it to businesses, we don't even let individuals pay for it. Um, uh, you could just use it for free if you're not using it at work. Um, we really try to make the product feel like a consumer product. You know, you can just go there and use it, and it's simple. And uh, we really hope that we're the product that people in the company want to use, and not the, the tool that they're emailed about that they have to use, um, yeah. and really try to set us apart as a brand. My, my best friend is building a company, and he's trying to do a lot of what you're doing, make something really simple and for normal people. but. I, I'm watching him code, and it, there's a lot of technology yeah. to make it look simple and yeah. make things happen on the screen. Tell me about the technology stack that you're using underneath. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm excited to actually have a geeky show where I can talk about it, because uh, <laughs> not, not many venues for that. But we actually thought one of the bigger and most interesting technology shifts with mobile devices was they were always kind of connected to the internet. You know, it's like yeah. if you go through a tunnel, you're not connected to the internet, but then one second later, you're connected again. And so we felt like the enemy of that experience, like the thing that stinks is the loading indicator. You know, where you get to the end and you press load and it looks like you have internet, but it's spinning and you don't really know, should I, you know, turn it into airplane mode and off again, trying to get the network to come back? Should I find a new Wi-Fi hotspot? And all of a sudden, it just we just felt like that. Even worse is when it crashes, like mine did, and it, mine crashed yeah, this morning. Yeah, mid-message or something. Yeah. We really felt that products were designed either to be 100% offline, like Microsoft Word in our case, or uh, completely online, like Google Docs, where you're just assuming you have a good Wi-Fi connection at a browser. And we really wanted that to be a completely seamless experience. So if you were online, everything was real time. It was like Google Docs. You could see people's typing as they were doing it, every keystroke. But then as you were walking, you went through that tunnel, it would just keep on working. You didn't even notice that you were offline. And then the moment you come back online, it synchronizes with the network again. Obviously, a more practical example besides my BART tunnel, which is obviously a huge issue for me personally, yeah. <laughs> is going on the airplane. You can just get online, get on an airplane, and every single document and quip is available. You don't need to mark them ahead of time. They're just there 100%. And you can even search for them. And the cool part about that experience is just that it's- So you built a search engine into the client. Well, it's more of like a autocomplete, more like a, if you've ever you know, used a Mac and used the command space bar for the, uh, to find your documents, it's, yeah. it's sort of like that. But the cool part about that is you never need to worry about whether you're, you have a network connection. And if you do, it lights up. And if you don't, everything continues to work. And to make that work, it's the synchronization problem is a very interesting technology problem. And we tried to 
sort of limit the scope of the problem so it was a solvable technology. And then all of our mobile apps now work offline. You can send messages, you can edit, you can do anything in the app offline because we've invested so much in that technology. Now, did you write all that code yourself or are you using components from open source? Uh, you know, we wrote data? it all ourselves. Our, our server stack is very traditional based on a lot of open source technologies uh, like you know MySQL and Memcache and Redis. Um, but our client is 100% homegrown, and we really felt like that's where we could uh, build some differentiating technology. Whereas we feel like the server, thanks to Rackspace and Amazon and open source, we really feel like that's not the place that, unless you're building an infrastructure company, we really needed to innovate. But on the client, we felt like every app was either a single user application or a cloud-based thing that had loading indicators everywhere. And we wanted to you know, be something that was the best of both of those worlds, and we felt like we really could have for, built something different. For there. other programmers, did you learn some best practices that, or things that, that were tougher that, they, that you should think through? Or? You know, I think one of the interesting things, I do feel like uh, the technologies I learned in college are all of a sudden hip again, um, meaning, you know, for a while, the network became almost free. Bandwidth and lat latency was going down. Bandwidth was going up. On a mobile device, that all switched again. Latency is super high. Bandwidth is questionable. Um, similarly, the disks are slow. <laughs> the, uh, you know, they're not always high memory devices. And all of a sudden, all the best practices that probably Microsoft engineers in the 90s were just experts at are all of a sudden in high demand again. And so. Give me some, sound, some examples. So just as an example, if you um, are in a document, a quick document, and you edit, you know, the second header here, where, so we say three no locations instead of two. Um, right now, that went to your phone uh, in real time, yeah. but it actually it didn't send um, the uh, entire document to your phone. Yeah, it okay. actually sent just that sentence. Oh, that's cool. Just, and so just a piece. Just that one sentence was synchronized with your phone. So it's just a handful of bytes. And we did that because we realized that if you had lots of people writing the same document at the same time and you're on a phone with a really bad 3G connection, we could get you that in real time if it were a really small segment, but not if we were sending the whole thing. So actually our product under the hood isn't even based on documents. Um, Every single paragraph, every single table cell is its own atomic unit. And whenever you change that, only that could synchronize to the network. And the rest of it uh, is sort of synchronized completely independently. And it means that our app just feels faster. Which um, shows why you else. can't, why Microsoft Word can't work. Because Microsoft Word was designed back 20, 30 years ago when, when we weren't going to do this kind of iterative thing. And the, the code that makes a Word document is not that easy to parse out, right? Yeah, I mean, in particular, if you've ever had a, probably a good way of illustrating this, if you go even on a really great service like Dropbox and you have a Word document in there and you both edit it at the same time, you just get a conflict. You know, get two versions of it and you just have to figure out who did what. It was not designed in a world with multiple people editing the same thing at the same time. And architecturally, it's just a different problem. And so we had the good fortune of not having that innovator's dilemma. We just started from scratch. So we just said, you know, we took a very aggressive approach. We said, we're not going to try to be uh, a product that just gets you from point A, you know, just takes you from the old era to the new. We want to reimagine where it will be and build out something really great there on the hopes that as businesses um, adopt smartphones and tablets in a more dramatic way, that products like ours will feel genuinely different. And I think a lot of the old technologies, it's a... Uh, it's both a good and a broad problem, bad problem to have. I mean, on one hand, they have millions and millions of people using Word documents. On the other hand, if our thesis is right, that the experiences that we built are becoming more important, I think it puts them in a tough position where they're either going to alienate their existing customers or not yeah, address their they, new customers. They almost have to uh, throw away the Word document format and start over to m make a a very object-oriented document that can be switched in and out. Easily. That's what we think, and actually I think broadly the cloud is uh, eliminating files uh, just in general. I mean, if, when I look at what I store, used to store in my Dropbox folder, it was MP3s. Now a lot of that for me is subscription music services. Yep. Photos, most of which I just put on Facebook now, and I don't really keep an archival version. I'm not as much of a photographer as you, though. No, but, I do pretty much the same and, thing. Uh, I, I actually put it in three places. Automatic, my phone <laughs> automatically sprays a photo up to uh, yeah. Google Plus, Facebook, yeah. and, and Dropbox, right? And then you know, and now for me, documents. Obviously, I've drank in the Kool Aid fully, but you know, I don't really have 
you know, documents as files anymore. I just have it in services like Quip. And I think that's a really interesting side effect of the move to the cloud is that these services are much sort of richer semantic types and they're not just like little files. You can't attach it to an email anymore. You know, it doesn't, it's, um, and I think that's a, all in all, I think it will be a usability win, but it's an awkward sort of short-term transition. You know, Word was created to create paper, and now we have a highly object-oriented uh, thing on our screen. And, and now that we have con kind of connectivity to other services, we can put graphs on there that are live, right? I, that, that's a very different thing than Bill Gates was talking about 25 years it ago. It is, and I'll show you a couple, like a really small example, because um, I, I think this is kind of the most interesting direction these could go. You know, one of the most popular features of Quip, actually I'll just leave this press release, this fake press release here since it's so cheesy. I'll go to the shopping list here. One of the most popular things you can do on Quip is make a checklist. It's just like a bulleted or a numbered list, but you can just make it a checklist. Kind of an obvious thing, but what's interesting is there's no checklist in Word. For obvious reasons, what are you gonna do, like print it out or something? But with a touch screen document that lots of people have access to, this becomes this really nice ad hoc task list. So my wife and I use it for our shopping list, for um, a lot of the tech companies that have uh, completely adopted Quip, they use this for most of their project management. You know, that thing that would be on the whiteboard in their open office. And it's really neat because, you know, when I check an item off in this checklist here, it actually generates the changes. You can see on the side, you can see my I'm Peter Astley in this demo right here, um, checked off one of the items in the checklist. You can actually see like who did what when. Um, and if you imagine taking this to a lot more broad interactive things, we support tables and other things like that, but why not maps? Why not incorporating data from the stock market? You know, there's a bunch of stuff you can do when you have interactive documents that you can actually touch and you know connection to the internet and so we hope that you know as the checklist is a really simple but i think the fact that it's so popular i think really illustrates how much people want this they want to make many applications not just many documents are e each of these uh, documents api can i can i shove data into them from another piece of code uh, we have a, a sort of an internal api that we're just starting to beta test with some customers so that should be more widespread probably in a month or so Okay. What, what challenges do you have building this that you didn't have with FriendFeed or, or working at Facebook? So this is not common equipment. Man, is it hard to develop for uh, essentially three different platforms, Android, iOS, and the desktop web. Um, they're just really different. You know, to make the best of breed application in all three, you know, you have to do it natively. And that means you have a Java code base and Objective-C code base and a JavaScript code base yeah. at the very minimum if you want to be available on the three dominant platforms. For those companies, you choose to support Windows Phone as well, which isn't as popular, but popular among some customers. That's just another, you know, language and platform on top of that. Um, so we spend a lot of time architecting our applications so we can share some of the complex things like our synchronization technology across all of those. Um, but it is, I think, a much more complex architecture than it once was just because the browser had sort of won. And you know, you can joke around about browser compatibility quirks, but it is nothing compared to the technology age that we're living in now. Now, because yeah, on iOS, you're using Objective-C and you're using probably Java and Android, right? That's so correct. That's quite a bit. <laughs> that's not, yeah, not so the same. Yeah, and so what we've done is we have our core synchronization technology as a native C++ library that's shared among all of those because that's where we feel like sort of the, uh, sort of the guts of our application are, where a lot of the interesting, complex technology is. And then on top of that, all the UI is written in the native language for the platform just so it can feel perfect. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's just the new normal. Every startup in the Valley who, uh, you know, some are iOS only, some are mobile only, we want to, you know, the premise of our application is it works on every device and that's really challenging. Um, another interesting thing that I think is sort of underreported and most startups don't deal with is uh, that Android, there's sort of the Google world around Android, which is very common in the US and Western Europe. 
And then there's the flavors of Android that exist in China and Russia and el elsewhere, and there's no Google Play, there's no Google push notifications, et cetera. Even on the iPhone, I, I was over in China and the yeah. kids rip out Apple's I, uh, iTunes store yep. and put in a, a Chinese store. Right? Yeah, it's a really different world, but that's where a lot of the growth in mobile is, and it's one of our more popular countries. So we support the Kindle Fire and Chinese versions of Android. and. Uh, to get that all working was a little pretty complex too. You just can't rely on the stuff that's baked into most Android phones. And so I would just say fragmentation broadly is uh, the biggest technological challenge for almost every single um, startup in the Valley right now. At FriendFeed, I, uh, you guys were on Amazon, weren't you? Were, uh, we were, actually had our own data center. We were, we were, uh, we're all uh, you know cloud services now, but uh, at the time we launched, uh, Amazon was pretty nascent and uh, it just didn't feel like many people were using it yet. Um, so I think we were just like a little bit early for that. But yeah. it was, I really wish we had been. <laughs> Every time the data center, uh, you know, you get the phone call that the power outage at the data center and you're like, oh my God, I have to drive somewhere. So. Yeah. At Facebook, you had your own data centers. You're not building, uh, yeah. building on. Well, did, did you develop your own cloud? variant that Facebook runs on, but it really... Uh, I think that probably is overstating it. When companies like Rackspace and Amazon are making things for other people, there's just a level of, you know, uh, service and user interface you build on top of things that you just don't do when you're developing internal services. So, yeah. um, so there was some of that, but it was much less formal than, than whatever else yeah. is building. Wow. Well, I could talk to you for hours because yeah. you, you, you've been around the valley now <laughs> at big company and small startup, you know. <laughs> It's really fun seeing you, and it's a great product. Uh, it, on Facebook last night, everybody's like, oh man, I love this tool, right? So, That's great, I really, really appreciate hearing it, that. Um, it's been out for, what, a few months now, right? Yeah, we've been out for seven, maybe eight, going on eight months, maybe eight months now. And what have you learned in that seven months? Maybe we'll wrap up. Yeah, so, um, a few things surprised us. Um, one is um, the iPad has been our most popular device. Um, I. We always knew that the iPad would be like our hero screenshot on our website, but my perception uh, among sort of my friends at the time was they spent a lot of time on their laptops at, at work and a lot of time on their phones when they're on the go. And I wasn't sure how much people actually wanted to create content on the iPad. I think a lot of those people sought us out, to be fair. You know, we're small yeah. enough now, it might be sort of skewed statistics, but it has been. A lot of people, when they have their iPad and they've wanted to make stuff on it, and there haven't been many tools that let them do that. And I think that um, that's been really interesting and we've put a lot more emphasis on the iPad and on the tablet. Um, we always knew over the long run we felt that that was going to happen, but I think that there are pockets within every company where there's someone who's going on a business trip with a Bluetooth keyboard and an iPad. Yep. And uh, I think that's happening a little sooner. So that's good, but also very surprising. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, sort of how people are using our service is a little bit different than we anticipated. We were originally thinking that we'd go up and describe our product is better than Microsoft Word in this way and better than Google Docs in this way. And what a lot of companies are using us for is essentially a collaboration tool. Um, you know, if I had to say the most common things that people are replacing, it's the sort of graveyard of unused collaboration tools. Everyone has Yammers. the wiki they didn't install, maybe a Yammer, maybe a SharePoint, maybe this, maybe that. We use Chatter here. Yeah, well, it's like, and there are a lot of these tools just have very low engagement. You know, people just go back to email or IM or texting or whatever they use. Um, because our app works on the phone, sends push notifications in a, you know, like a mobile messaging service does. Companies have observed that essentially we can be like a very high engagement sort of wiki or, you know, so they'll do their engineering design documents in there, you know, they'll do their project management in there. That's something they needed outside of email so that like new employees could go see it, you know, which is the big problem with emails. It's sort of siloed in people's inboxes. Um, so I think since we've launched, you know, uh, our consumer, so, you know, people just going to the app store are using it for notes and documents. But within companies, we put a lot of work into collaboration, you know, which is not a surprise given all of our social features. But I think, I think it's become much more of an explicit product focus for us, um, much earlier than I thought it might have been otherwise. One last yeah. question. Uh, tell me about the company. How is it funded, and what's the team like? Yeah. So we are uh, 15 people now, um, mainly engineers. We're about four non-engineers, and that's split between sort of sales and support. Um, and 
We uh, raised $15 million led by Benchmark Capital, Peter Fenton, um, who's a very well-known VC on the boards of uh, New Relic and Twitter and a bunch yeah. of other pretty well-known companies. Um, I had worked with him at, at FriendFeed, actually. He led Benchmark's investment in FriendFeed. So, and, uh, so fairly well capitalized and fairly small. <laughs> very cool. Uh, where do we get it again? Uh, Quip.com, or you can get it in, in Android or uh, Apple's App Store. Just search for Quip. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me.